Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well. So, we continue our reading of the Sword of Allah, Halid bin Al Walid. It is part two of the campaign of the apostasy period. This is a very action packed book. I enjoy reviewing it because it reads like a movie, and I found that very cool. The writer did an excellent job. Okay, let's begin. Go ahead and listen to this as you are typing, you're gaming, pruning your garden, whatever it is you're doing. On the orders of Halid, the Muslim army again swept forward the cries of Allahu Akbar and the war cry of this battle, Ya Muhammad. The smaller army again engaged the superior massed forces of the apostates. The wings clashed with the wings, and the center with the center. The commander of the Muslim right, Zaid, okay, so Zaid's commanding the right, confronted Rajal, the renegade who commanded the infidel left. Wishing to save the renegade from the first of hell, Zaid called, O oh, Rajal, you left the true faith. Return to it. That would be more noble and virtuous. The renegade refused, and in the fierce duel that followed, Zaid dispatched Rajal to the fire. Interesting, so Zaid and Rajal, they came to their combat. The Muslims launched violent assaults all along the front, and the apostates were hard put to hold their ground. Yet, hold it they did. Their front would not break. I noticed that when you watch these battle... When you watch, you know, the traditional battles, breaking the front line was very important. And so the fact that they couldn't break that line shows you that they had good formation. Apostates fell in hundreds, and Muslim casualties also began to mount. With the apostates superior in numbers, and the Muslims superior in skill and courage, the two sides were evenly matched. Parts of the two fronts locked in mortal combat heaved back and forth. See, I like how he describes that. Because this type of tense battle, you can imagine the smell of just the constant wounds these men are enduring. The heat of the sun, the sweat and the salt smell just dagging and slashing and arrows and horses and you know the commanders telling which wing to go where to hold the center it, it, the intense amounts of energy concentrated on that battlefield it just kind of shows you how the men of those times you did your duty you didn't know if you were going to survive and they held their position. It's quite amazing. The dust from the thousands of stomping feet rose and hung like a cloud over the heads of the belligerents. Wow, yeah, so think about that imagery. Just the sand and everything. It's You're a commander on your horseback watching it. You have to be focused, diligent, the women wondering if their husbands will come home. Mothers wondering if their sons will come home. Fathers hoping that their sons do well. Broken swords and spears littered the wadi, and the plain as mangled and torn bodies fell, and heaps on the blood sudden earth. The most dreadful carnage took place in the gully in which human blood ran in a rivulet down the wadi. As a result, this gully became known as the Gully of Blood, Shueb Udam, and it is still known by that name. But the battle hung in the balance and gave no promise of decision. So the Gully of Blood. Wow, so, you know, many people have talked about how in the ancient times, 
these fertile forests fertilized with the blood of men sacrificing themselves testosterone filled blood drenching the soil because everyone knows at farms that blood animal blood is a great fertilizer really the soil drinks it up the tree roots absorb it it's really quite fascinating and so not only are the lands imprinted with the fallen bones of those people who fought there but the soil itself has taken part in the battle by absorbing the aftermath it's really quite compelling I really enjoy this book if you haven't told if you can't tell <laughs> Halid now realized that with their fanatical faith in their false prophet the apostates would not give in it was evident that the only death of Muslima could break the spirit of the infidels so this is another interesting aspect you take out the leader and the demoralization happens to his followers and they'll scatter to the wind that's why protecting your leaders and your leaders protecting you and having this type of bond is very important it would be a moral setback which could lead quickly to physical defeat but Muslima was not dueling in front like Khalid oh <laughs> coward so that shows you the contrast then Muslima made sure he wasn't in the front lines the vanguard when Khalid he's right up in it he tells you a lot about the strategy about how these men wanted to participate in this war he would have to be drawn out of the safety of the apostate ranks in which he stood surrounded by his faithful followers drawing him out isn't that interesting they know he's in a position surrounded right they got to go through the thick of it to get to him how do they get him to come out it's really quite interesting that's why I like reading about these ancient battles it's quite different than today as the first violent spasm of combat spent itself the warriors stopped to regain their breath there was a lull then Halid stepped out towards the enemy center and threw a challenge to single combat oh that's amazing oh that's just amazing single combat this is like you one on one I mean come on man like I heard that Halid had he was a polygamist he also had um, concubines but a bunch of children you can see why the ladies liked him man he's literally like one on one I'm going on the front lines handling business you know quote I am the son of Al Walid will anyone duel several champions came out of the apostate ranks to accept the challenge of Halid and advanced towards him one by one Halid took perhaps a minute to dispose of each opponent after each duel he would recite his own extemporized verses there's a poem here for us I mean that's pretty see that's so freaking cool I don't think a lot of people realized how I certainly didn't before reading these kinds of books that men could recite back then in American culture men who recite any kinds of type of poetry or verse were seen as gay or weak just not right but obviously by learning about another culture we see the skill of the mind and skill of the sword when some of us are taught those two things are separate right it really is enlightening that's why i enjoy this book okay so the verses are as follows i am the son of many chiefs my sword is sharp and terrible it is the mightiest of things when the pot of war boils fiercely wow so that's the end of it and it says here the citation for that is a bid volume 2 page 513 
the pot of war boils fiercely. The adrenaline, if you've ever felt an intense amount of adrenaline and anger, even just anger or adrenaline, you can understand how your nervous system, your dopamines, your cortisol, everything is like, whoa, right? So imagine in war times where you actually couldn't hide and be a sniper. You actually had to get up closer and deal with your enemy. What men had to muster within their souls to get the job done. And men being on the battlefield and all of them having this intense concentration of energy course it's going to be like that raging boil it's a very cool poetic way to describe it isn't it slowly and steadily Khalid advanced towards Muslima killing champion after champion then there were none left brave enough to come forth against him but by now he was close enough to Muslima to talk to him without shouting <laughs> so did you see what he did there so he's Stepping closer, taking out a champion, right? The fact that he has the energy to do this shows you the physical fitness of this man. Because imagine, if you've ever been in a fight, I know I have, where you're punching the crap out of someone and they're punching the crap out of you when you're finally done. Sometimes in a fight, well, actually, I'll put it this way. Someone gives up. When you're slugging someone's face, I'm not talking like how some girls pull hair and roll on the carpet. They're just idiots. I'm talking like girls who, that I fought, who were, they're slugging you like a man. Like they're trying to knock your jaw off. Eventually, someone is going to tire and they pull back. And then you see this pull back and you can get on top of them and wrestle them and put them to sleep knock them out or you can have your your friends will push you to the side push them to the side the fight's over right but there's a moment where someone breaks because they're exhausted right they can't handle it anymore that's just with one fight and you ain't swinging no heavy sword so in the mental testing of having to slash and move and avoid and jolt it shows you how these men were just built different he's knocking down champions and he systematically moved himself like a chess piece closer to his opponent to where he now no longer has to shout i mean that's pretty pretty intense the liar however was surrounded by his guards and halid could not get at him Khalid proposed talks. Muslima agreed. He stepped forward and cautiously and halted just outside dueling distance of Khalid. Quote, If we agree to come to terms, what terms will you accept? inquired Khalid. I like this. What terms will you accept? So he's trying to talk to him. But Muslima is still staying in his safe little nest. It's just quite fascinating. Musima cocked his head to one side as if listening to some invisible person who stood beside him and would talk to him. It was in this manner that he received revelations. Seeing him thus remind Halid of the words of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, who had said that Muslima was never alone, that he always had Satan beside him, that he never disobeyed Satan, and that when worked up he foamed at the mouth. Satan forbade Muslima to agree to terms. The liar turned his face to Halid and shook his head. So that's interesting. I wish he had a citation there for us. Where what hadith that was from or how he got that. But it kind of just shows how you have an imposter prophet. And how the contrasting nature of receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one from Iblis. Because you, we must remember who's at the disadvantage here 
is sometimes leaders come to a, an agreement when the battle has gotten hot. But if he's rejecting, there's something else afoot. Halid had already determined to kill Muslima. The talks were only a bait to draw him close enough. He would have to work fast before Muslima withdrew to the safety of his guards. Halid asked for another question. Again, Muslima turned his head to one side, intently listening to the voice. At that instant, Halid sprang at him. <laughs> to draw, to bait him, to draw him close enough. So he's strategic, like he's strategizing how he's going to get that fool. Halid was fast, but Muslima was faster. In a flash, he had turned on his heels and was gone. Muslima was safe once again in the arms of his guards. But in that moment of flight, something meaningful happened to the spirit of the two armies. Depressing one and exalting the other, the flight of their prophet and commander from Halid was a disgraceful sight in the eyes of the apostates. Aha, so he fleed. They become more demoralized. The Muslims rejoice to exploit the psychological opportunity which now presented itself. Halid ordered an immediate renewal of the offensive. So the Muslims saw what happened. Dude flees. They're all pumped up. The apostates are like, oh, our leader is like totally just not doing his thing. But he got away. <laughs> he ran away. <laughs> what a coward. Uh, what do you think, Val?